Hello, everybody. Sorry about the two minutes delay. Uh, there was a very heavy traffic today. Uh, today's lecture is going to be entirely devoted into morphisms and uh, what they induce. Uh, I hope I will manage to say at least most of what I plan to say today. But um, my today's lecture is going to be in two parts. Uh, because first part belongs to the previous semester. I'm just going to use uh, lecture notes and highlight them sort of to speed it up a little bit. And then when we come to the path algebraic material, I will switch to the whiteboard and I'll start writing. Okay, so uh, of course, those of you who attended my lecture in the previous uh, term, you should remember the definition of a homomorphism, but I added many, many other definitions. So you see this definition 167 blew up. Now I have like four definitions over here. And let me explain everything piece by piece. So the first definition is completely obvious. I mean, there is, it's no brainer. No matter how hard you think, this is the most obvious concept of a morphism of a graph, right? What, what is a homomorphism? A homomorphism is, is a map or, or a bunch of maps that preserve a structure. Here, the structure of a graph is, is, is of the source and the target maps. And how do you preserve them? Well, first you must have a, a map from the set of vertices to the set of vertices then you have to have a map from the set of edges to the set of edges. And these maps have to be compatible with the source and the target maps, which is given by these two equations. You can draw it in the form of commutative diagram. So basically, roughly speaking, uh, what these conditions mean that if, if your edge ends at a certain vertex, uh, and then you map both the edge and the vertex uh, to, to the other graph, then, then this mapped uh, vertex, so this mapped edge begins at exactly uh, F of its beginning in the previous graph. I mean, you have these equations, the same goes for a target. Uh, it's best to look at it uh, in the form of a primitive diagram. But now uh, we need to be a little bit more subtle and uh, define a proper morphism, a proper homomorphism of graphs. And properness, well, it's a very important concept in mathematics. When I switch to the whiteboard, I will give you some uh, uh, details about uh, the concept of properness in general, its role in the Baumkorn conjecture, and so on and so forth. I, I don't want to do it right now because I, I cannot write. Uh, I don't have whiteboard. Uh, so switching between the two takes too much time. But I'll get back to explaining to you why I called it proper. However, uh, it, for the discrete topology, proper simply means finite to one. Okay. So uh, the condition is that when I have my homomorphism of graphs, I call it proper if the preimage of every vertex is finite and the preimage of every edge is finite. Okay, this is what I mean finite to one. And I need this properness assumptions in order for a morphism of graphs to induce a homomorphism of pathologies. So I do it for a reason. Well, also for a reason, now this time for if you want covariant factor of pushing forward uh, from graphs to uh, path algebras, I can define something slightly more general. So instead of uh, having a map uh, from vertices to vertices and from edges to edges, I take the whole bunch, I take all finite paths in E and I take all finite paths in F and I have a set of theoretical map from FPE to FPF, all right? However, I have to put some conditions. So vertices are sacred. Vertices can be mapped only to vertices. If you forget this condition, nothing works. And then you have much as you had before, you, you must uh, assume that this map F preserves the beginnings and the ends of all paths. And this is written in terms of these two commutation rules. This is exactly as it was before. Only, only before I, I had two separate maps and, and here this map F, well, it's a, it's a map from all finite paths. So it's a map from vertices, it's a map from edges and uh, all finite paths. And then you have the following very important condition, uh, namely it has to preserve the concatenation of paths. So if you have two paths in your graph E that you can concatenate, which means that the end of P is the beginning of Q, then F of the composed path PQ must be the same as F of P and F of Q. And please note that this is well-defined as a path because of the condition number two, right? 
So, so it's because T of P, now, by the way, I, I should have put here a, a subscript. It should be T E of P and S E of Q, sorry. Yeah, I, and, and by the way, I should have highlighted it, sorry. Do, 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 do. Right, so, so because of condition two, uh, this is well defined. And I, as I was saying here, I, I missed the subscripts E should be TE and should be SE, but you know perfectly well what I mean. Okay, so this is a path homomorphisms of, of graphs. I don't know if it's the best name. If you have another idea, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. I called it a path homomorphism because it maps paths to paths. I somehow don't like the word generalized homomorphism and so on and so forth. It's so much used and abused in mathematics. It doesn't make a good impression. Also, pseudo homomorphism, no, I somehow didn't like it. And this at least indicates uh, what it is all about. However, it's no longer obvious that a path homomorphism is more general than a homomorphism, but you will see it in a sec. And much as before, uh, I define a proper path homomorphism simply by saying that uh, this map is finite to one. So now I don't have to say it separately for F0 and F1. I have everything in one simple F. And uh, I call a path homomorphism of graphs proper if it is finite to one. And finally, completely obvious uh, definition, but let me state it nevertheless. When do I call something injective or subjective? Well, maybe it's not most beautifully written, but I want it to be concise. And uh, this is why I phrase it like this. So you say that any of these about morphisms is injective or subjective if all set theoretical maps defining uh, your morphism are injective or subjective. So for a path homomorphism, it just means that F itself is injective or subjective. And for a homomorphism of graphs proper or not, uh, it means that both F0 and F1 are injective or both F0 and F1 are subjective, okay? So these are the definitions. Uh, the first one is completely obvious. Uh, the other ones are more elaborate, but they are simply dictated by our needs uh, in path algebras, Levy path algebras, graphs. It's, it's all going to be used later on. Okay, any questions here perhaps? No. So now I have a bunch of elementary facts, in fact, quite a lot of them. Uh, and the first one is the following. So if you take a graph homomorphism, then you can easily define its image by saying that it's F0 of E0 as vertices, it's F1 of E1 as edges, and you take appropriate restrictions of the source and the target maps. And then what I claim that this is a subgraph of F. Well, to check that something is a subgraph when it's given by restrictions, it's simply I simply have to verify that when I uh, apply my source map uh, to F1 of E1, I will necessarily land in F0 of E0, okay? You can always restrict the domain, but you have to verify that when you restrict your domain, you will land in the restriction of a target. And that's what we are verifying here. This is elementary. I take any vertex uh, E uh, in E1, uh, I take an element in F1, E1, which is F1 of E, and I apply the restricted uh, source map. By definition, it's just the source map applied to this element. But because of a definition of a morphism, SF, F1 is the same as F0, SE. But now uh, F0, SE, of course, is just an element of F0, E0. So everything restricts as desired and is identical reasoning, uh, let me not say it, for the target maps. So that's the first elementary fact. The image of a uh, graph homomorphism is a subgraph in the target graph. So here it was very trivial, but uh, for these of you who know sister algebras, uh, a theorem saying that a star homomorphism uh, from that the image of a star homomorphism from a sister algebra to a sister algebra is a sister algebra is a very, very non trivial theorem. The problem being proving that the image is closed. He okay, had, for instance, in Caddis and Ringroves, but this is quite a big theorem. So it's not always obvious that, that the image, uh, when you have a homomorphism between two objects, uh, it's not always obvious that the image of such a homomorphism is a sub object in the other object. Here it was easy for sister algebra, it is not. Okay, 
another elementary fact. When I take a homomorphism of graphs, then it induces uh, a set theoretical map from FPE to FPF. So from all finite paths in E into all finite paths in F. And it is defined as follows. For every uh, vertex, F of V is just F0 of V by definition. For every edge, F of E is just F1 of E. But now when you take any path of length bigger than one, so you have a sequence of concatenated edges from E1 to EN, where N is at least two, then by definition, F of such a path is just a path which you obtain by having a sequence of F1, E1, F1, E2, up to F1, EN. And by the, the compatibility condition defining a graph homomorphism, you know that if uh, EI and EI plus one are um, compatible in the sense they can be concatenated, then also F1 of EI and F1 of EI plus one can be concatenated. All right, so this is well defined. This is also a path in, in, uh, in, in a graph F and it's a path of the same length. Now, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, path, uh, it's a path homomorphism of graphs. That's, that's obvious by, by the very definition. We can now, now check, so, so this is the statement, yeah, I should also highlight it, that the thus defined map from FPE to FPF, I call the induced map, uh, is a path homomorphism of graphs. Well, let's look it up, what it means to be a path homomorphism. The first condition is obviously satisfied. The second condition is also obviously satisfied uh, because you have it for F0 and F1. And, and now uh, this one is also obviously satisfied by definition, because what does it mean to, to have f of p or f of q or f of pq? Can you decompose p and q? Well, if, if, if they are edges, that's done by definition. If one of them is a path, you decompose this longer than one, then you decompose into a bunch of edges, then you apply this definition and, and you see it works uh, immediately, okay? So uh, yeah, and, and, and here basically it means that the, that the beginnings and the ends of paths are preserved, but of course, because the beginning of a path is the beginning of its first edge and the end of a path is the end of this last edge, uh, these conditions are satisfied because of, of uh, these conditions for graph homomorphisms. Yeah, these ones, okay. So that's obvious that I have the induced uh, path homomorphism. So this way you can see that uh, a path homomorphism of graphs is a generalization of a homomorphism of graphs. And uh, a nice way to characterize it is by saying that uh, a path homomorphism uh, of graphs that is induced from a homomorphism of graphs, it preserves the length of paths. And this is clear from the definition. The length of paths is preserved. But vice versa, if you have a path homomorphism of graphs that preserves the length of paths, then it is indeed induced by homomorphism of graphs, right? That's because of this of this property that if you if you write uh, if you write that p q is equal to p prime q prime, but you know that the length of p is equal to the length of p prime and the length of q is equal to the length of q prime, then you must have it that you have it that p q equals p prime q prime implies p equals p prime and q equals p prime. We used it already before. So using this uh, particular feature of concatenation of paths, uh, you can indeed conclude that if the length is preserved, then uh, it really comes from a homomorphism of graphs. Well, indeed, in particular, you must map an edge to an edge. And if you map an edge to an edge by, by this property, uh, which you have over here, this property, right? When you know the value on edges, you know value on all paths. But then this is exactly like the definition that you have over here at the bottom, right? So, so this is a way to characterize uh, a homomorphism of graphs among path homomorphism of graphs. These are homomorphisms uh, that have a property that they preserve the length of paths. Okay, so that's what we just uh, established and discussed. Yeah, and, and, and it immediately follows from what we just said that if 
a path homomorphism of graphs maps edges to paths, then it does not come from a homomorphism of graphs. And that's a generalization, all right? I must map vertices to vertices. But now when it comes to edges, well, I can map them to paths and still have all these conditions. You see one, two, three, all these conditions, one, two, three satisfied in a consistent way. And, and, and believe me, it comes very useful in non-commutative topology. In order to understand uh, examples such as standard Podlash quantum sphere or higher dimensional CP and Qs of waxman seibelman uh, that's exactly what we have to put in our push-out diagram of, of graphs. Okay, these uh, these have to be maps that are more general, morphisms that are more general. Okay, good. Let's continue. We go to. Elementary fact number three. Yeah, I, that's also quite obvious. Well, after all, these are elementary facts, so they should they better be obvious. <laughs> um, now, if you restrict your attention to proper homomorphism of graphs, then of course the induced map is a proper path homomorphism of graphs. Why is it? Because uh, uh, the union of the F a finite union of finitely, um, say, let me say it again. Uh, if I take finitely many sets, and uh, if I have finitely many finite sets, then their union is finite. That's what happens here, right? And 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 basically, well, actually, I didn't say it quite correctly because no, no, no. I said, wait a second. Uh, yeah, this multiplies. This multiplies. So so uh, no, wait. So this is about the pre-images. So, so when I take a, a preimage, a, a, a preimage of um, of a, of a path, and and I have that this is a, a, a morphism which is uh, induced uh, by a graph homomorphism, then, then basically what you see is is that you, you so, so you multiply. So, so the finite product of finite numbers is finite. Sorry, this is what I want to say. Yeah. Uh, because because what happens is is that uh, you take uh, all all pre images of, of of you have a path which is composed out of edges then you take all all pre images of the first edge all pre images of the second edge and so on and so forth and and when you multiply all these possibilities these will be all paths that can be in the pre image of your path that's something you can easily show and uh, yeah, this pops out uh, later on in uh, more advanced elementary facts. But I hope it's clear. You, you, it, it, it comes, it comes uh, from this crucial property that the start points and end points of edges and paths are respected. Yeah. Th th this is this is how you can convince yourself that uh, in the case of having a path homomorphism that preserves. Uh, lengths, so induced from homomorphism of graphs, then you have no choice. If you if you take all paths which are in in the preimage uh, of a given path, then then it will be really a composition of all edges that are in the preimages of the respective edges, and then you have that all all possibilities will be counted by by multiplying finitely many finite numbers. See, that's why I don't like so much lecturing from a lecture notes because instead of speaking, I would be writing it. But uh, I, I, I somehow want to make sure that that's the material that belongs to the previous semester. Okay. And this is a remark which I actually spelled out in the previous semester, but it was on my slides. Uh, we discussed it, uh, but. Uh, this is very interesting, very handy. You see, you can view a graph as a small category. Small category means that, that the class of objects is a set. So uh, you look at the set of vertices as objects of your category, and you look at paths as morphisms between these objects. So a path from V to W is a morphism from object V to object W. And you have as many morphisms as you have paths. And then all these rules of concatenations are the same as rules for composition of morphisms, so everything works. This is a small category. 
And then when you look into these rules of what it means to have a path homomorphism of graphs, then basically what you are saying is that you have a functor. You see, condition number one means that you map your functor maps object to object. That's how it must go. Then this is the crucial condition that, that if you map, if your functor maps uh, object A to F of A and object B to F of B, then it maps a morphism from A to B into a morphism from F of A to F of B. If it is a covariant functor and here it is a, a covariant functor. So, so that's the second rule. And then of course, the crucial property of a functor is that it preserves composition of morphisms. And this is precisely this condition. So, so, so when I look at the path homomorphism of graphs, this is simply saying that I'm taking a functor uh, between small categories defined by respective graphs. I think this is very cute to, to think about it this way. And when you're writing a paper and you don't want to state too many obvious things, then you can just say, okay, let's F be a functor between graphs if you the small categories. All right, and now we get into two elementary facts that are a little bit more advanced. And I want to give them to you as exercises for the next time. Let me do it carefully, step by step. I apologize for so many new objects that I'm going to introduce. It's very unpleasant when you have to introduce many, many new definitions, but somehow here the situation is subtle and uh, it's important to distinguish different cases. And to distinguish different cases, we have to label them somehow. So try to grab the gist of the idea instead of memorizing of what everything stands for. Anyway, I try to name it in a way that is easy to remember. So USR is a unital semi-ring. So let's go start out the category of unital semi-rings, unital semi-ring uh, homomorphism as uh, morphisms. Then I take IPG uh, and by IPG, I mean, this is like in, in, in injective path uh, homomorphism of graphs. So this is the category of graphs with path homomorphisms of graphs that are injective on vertices. So here I have already something weird. That's not really expected. Why should I be injective on vertices? But I'll show you that this is necessary for uh, a functor to be well defined. Okay, so I'm not taking, and of course you, you can see that this is a subcategory because um, if I if I compose uh, well, you you have to verify. It, but I'm, what I'm using is the following thing that uh, f restricted to vertices land in vertices. Okay, so if I have f and g, so f goes from e to f, and g goes from f to g. Yeah, and again, when I'm not writing, you don't see which letter is capital, which <laughs> is lowercase. <laughs> but this is elementary. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can follow it. Uh, uh, so, so then uh, uh, when I restrict my f to E0, of course, it lands in F0. And when I restrict my G to F0, of course, it lands in G0. And, and, and then these restrictions are assumed to be injective, and composition of injective things is injective. Okay, so this is really a subcategory. I'm, I'm not doing something silly here, but somebody will do this as an exercise, so everything will be spelled out. Okay, so this looks like a weird category, but it's useful to define a functor. And uh, okay, so this is IPG. Then I take BPG, uh, which is slightly stronger. Now I demand that uh, this, uh, of course, this is still path homomorphism of graphs, so I don't necessarily map edges to edges, but I do assume that the restriction to vertices is bijective. And I need it to preserve unitality, okay? So now with these uh, assumptions of what I mean, actually notation, this is just notation for categories. Uh, now I can make the following claims. So first claim, is going to be an exercise. So don't, don't take it as obvious, you need to prove it. I mean, it's not difficult, but you need to prove it. So I take uh, what is an object in my category VPG, 
Well, that's still just a graph, an arbitrary graph. And to an arbitrary graph, I can assign a, a unital semi-ring, RE. Remember the definition, RE is the unital semi-ring of all um, subsets of FPE. So, so, so this RE is the set of all subsets of uh, the set of all finite paths in E, okay? But now this is a unital semi-ring, so it's an object in USR. It's not USSR, it's USR. But now it's more interesting with morphisms. Okay, here we already had this construction from E to RE. And, and now this B comes into play because otherwise, well, BPG, IPG is the same, objects are the same. I only change the morphisms. And this frequently happens in, in a, you see, you remember morphisms are always more important than objects. For instance, in sister algebras, one obvious category would be to say, start, say take star homomorphisms as morphisms, but the very important category is to say that elements of a KK group from A to B are morphism in category. So you, you don't have to, when you choose your objects, you don't have to restrict yourself to such and not other morphisms. And these are morphisms which hide some nice subtleties that you want to study, okay? So uh, and now I'm taking uh, these morphisms that are bijective on vertices. And it's also intuitively quite nice. When you have bijection among uh, vertices, basically what you're saying, I have, I fix my set of vertices. It's sacred, I don't change it. And I play around just with arrows. And this is quite all right, yeah? Your, your base points are fixed. The, the net, well, it's not the net yet. Uh, you, you have this cloud of vertices. This is just nothing but a discrete set, but you keep it fixed. And then you have different connections by, by edges in, in one graph and different connections by edges in another graph. So the interplay is just between the edges. So that's not such a weird assumption. It's very natural when you study some examples. Okay, and now, uh, well, how I define a covariant functor. That's a push forward map. I simply take a set of finite paths and I map it to the image under F. Well, after all, F is a map from FPE to, to FPF. So it maps finite paths to finite paths. So I can take its image on the subset. Okay. So it's perfectly well defined. I take a subset uh, in FPE and I obtain a subset in FPF. So that's well defined when it comes to uh, sets, but of course you still have to check that F star is uh, is 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 um, yeah that it will be um, preserving. That is a functor. This is what you have to prove. Okay, that's uh, several steps, and 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 the most important thing is to prove that when I take. Uh, a path homomorphism of graphs, which is bijective on vertices, but it gives me a unital semi-ring homomorphism. And bijectivity is for unitality, and injectivity is for having a ring homomorphism. Okay. So, but this is an exercise. And one of the reasons that I do want you to do it as an exercise is because we'll have analogous statements to five and six uh, uh, in terms of path algebras, and that's what I'll do on the whiteboard. And proofs are quite analogous. So, so as we had it before, you know, we have some statements in the realm of semi-rings, so pure graphs, and then we have analogous statements in the realm of path algebras. These are not identical things, these are not identical arguments, but they are really in the same spirit. So you can see that uh, path algebras are just very natural linearizations. This is taking a path algebra of a graph is a very natural linearization of a graph itself. You don't add much information. You basically just choose a field, that's all, okay? This is a very natural construction. And this is why so much what you can do uh, in pure graph theory by, by just studying graphs and nothing more, no extra input data. When you, I look at the semi-ring uh, RE or RFE, I'm not having any extra input data. I'm just arranging information already encoded in the graph in some algebraic form, but I'm not adding anything. And, and, and much of what I can do with this 
pure graph information that happens at the level of, of uh, Papa Antibus as well. Okay. Now, uh, how about IPG? I mean, I defined it for a reason. So what do I claim here? Well, first note that as the image of a finite subset is finite subset, when I restrict uh, myself to, to just a um, uh, finite subset of FPE, then by this construction, I'll map them into finite subsets of FPF, okay? So a restriction to, to REF, to the subring REF, will give me a map into the sub, subring uh, of, of uh, RF. Yeah, so, so, so that's nice. I, I, I now have an assignment which uh, also works. So here, of course, I replace R with RF. So now E is mapped to REF, right? And, and uh, so this is what I'm saying. R is replaced by REF and, and it, it, it makes sense because of what I said, because the image of a finite subset is a finite subset. So F uh, subsweet star really maps uh, from RFE into RFF, okay? But well, what else do I do now that I am no longer in the category of unital rings, because I don't assume that the set of vertices is finite, I can use IPG. I can use just path homomorphisms of graphs that are injective on vertices. But objectivity was only needed for unitality. When, when, when my, my, my category is just category of uh, semi-rings instead of category of unital semi-rings, I don't care about unitality. So, so what, what, I'm, what, I'm, uh, what we are doing here, we are, by taking this restricted construction, by having an assignment given by uh, R, uh, F instead of R, okay? So I, 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 I have a restricted assignment if you want, but, in, but then I can use more general categories. IPG is more general than BPG because every bijection is an injection, but not vice versa. And uh, SR is more general than USR because every unital semi-ring is a semi-ring, but not vice versa, okay? So by having this restricted assignment, I get a functor from a bigger category to a bigger category. And basically once you establish that, that this is a functor, it's obvious that the other one is also a functor. Because all that you, you have to uh, check is that uh, the domain category and the target category match, but, but uh, we just did it. That's the first line, the image of a finite subset is a finite subset. So you have, have a nice match. And well, if you, if you uh, see the proof here of, of, of this earlier statement, and you see that all you need is injectivity to prove that F star uh, of, uh, of F star applied to a, 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 an L amorphism in IPG, yeah, that, that you only use uh, injectivity of, of a path homomorphism between graphs. Uh, then this F star of such a morphism is really a ring from a morphism. You need just the injectivity, okay? And um, yeah, uh, uh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the statement. And, and then of course, uh, if something works for, uh, if something works for, uh, for uh, fine for all sets, it also works for finite sets. If something works for injections, it also works for bijections. So this ring homomorphism property will of course be satisfied, and 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 the factoriality is obvious in both cases because uh, uh, you can clearly see that uh, F star composed with G star is the same as F composed with G parentheses and then star, uh, because it's just taking the subsequent uh, images. So F circle G of A is exactly G of F of A. Sorry, F, F of G of A. So it composes in the right way, in the covariant way. All right. And now we have a very much similar statements, but now we are proper. So it's quite like it was in the point five, but now we discuss it assuming that our morphisms are proper. Okay. 
And also another thing is that uh, th th these functors that we discussed above were covariant functors. So they preserve the direction of morphisms. But now in this setting, we are going to discuss a contravariant functor. And this is why we need properness. So it's kind of funny when you are studying um, covariant functors, you need this injectivity by injectivity on vertices. But then you don't care about any properness, it's irrelevant. Whether you talk about finite subsets or all subsets, it's, it's irrelevant. But simply because for any map, the image of a finite set is finite set. This is of course not true for the pre-images. Pre-image of a finite set might be infinite. That's why we need properness, okay? So when we construct a, a contravariant functor, we need to assume properness. However, then we don't care about uh, anything else. Injectivity, bijectivity, or vertices, that's all irrelevant, okay? So now we take OG, this is like oriented graphs, that's the category of graphs, the homomorphism of graphs as morphism. So that's the category we defined to start with. Now, POG, this means uh, the same objects, but our homomorphisms are proper in the sense we explained at the beginning. And now I take the assignment. First, I'm, I'm doing the first case, I'm studying OG. And again, the, the, on objects, it's exactly the same. I, I, I map a graph to its unit or semi ring RE, consisting of all subsets of the set of all finite paths in a graph E. But now I'm doing something completely different on morphisms. When I have a morphism, ah, and there is, sorry, there is one, there is another subtlety which I forgot to emphasize. So here we have path homomorphisms, okay? So first we don't care about properness. Secondly, we don't care about the preservation of length, okay? These need not be a graph homomorphisms. They are path homomorphisms of graphs, okay? But all we care about is, is injectivity or bijectivity on indices. So here we drop this. We don't need this injectivity, bijectivity on vertices, but not only we need properness, we also need that these are uh, morphisms that preserve length. So in other words, they are, they, they are morphisms, uh, these are path, uh, homomorphisms of graphs that are induced by proper homomorphisms of graphs, okay? But the construction is the same. I take uh, any graph, I assign to it its, its unit of semi-ring, so it's an object in USR, and now look what happens with uh, morphisms. Now, because I want to be contravariant, I have to give you a ring, a unit of semi-ring homomorphism, but not from RE to RF, but from RF to RE. And I define it in the following way. I take an object A, this time in RF. So this is a uh, subset of FPF and I assign to it its preimage. So of course it's a subset of FPE. Okay, so at the level of a definition it is well defined. And, and here I, I wrote for the sake of being precise that this map F is a map from FP to FPF, which is induced by F0, F1, exactly as we explained it earlier. Yeah, this was this, um, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, here you have this definition. That's how you induce it. But that's completely obvious. This is totally natural. So uh, you can remember it, no problem. Or I could have simply said that I have a path from homomorphism that preserves lines. That's the same thing. <laughs> okay, and now the claim is, but again, you have to prove it. It's not immediately obvious that this defines a contravariant function. Uh, here, as before, the subtlety is to prove that uh, indeed uh, F star of a, of, of a homomorphism of of, uh, of uh, graphs induces, but this, this, this in, induces a, um, a, a unitary ring homomorphs, okay? 
that's that's what you have to play with. It's not entirely obvious what happens when when you multiply uh, f inverse of a times f inverse of b. Will it be f inverse of a b? That's what you have to prove. Okay, that's the, that's the most important thing. And then because it's simply uh, pre images and pre images act in a contravariant way, right? You know that f circle g pre image is the same as uh, g pre image circle f pre image. So that's basically what gives you this contravariant functoriality, okay? So here we didn't use properness yet because we took the unital semi-ring of all subsets of the set of paths of a graph, of finite paths of a graph. But uh, when you go to path algebras, you somehow like your things to be finitely supported and, uh, and uh, you take, uh, a finite linear span of chi p's. So this means that your set over which you sum is a finite subset of a set of paths. So it's important to consider this restricted, not necessarily unital semi-ring. And much as it was before in the covariant scenario, if f is finite to one, so you need this properness, okay? And uh, th then you just immediately conclude that the pre-image of a finite subset is a finite subset because a finite union of finite subsets is a finite subset. So, so yeah, good. Uh, uh, you, you see that now when you when you uh, change R into RF, then this recipe F star F pullback F superscript star. Well, when, when you take a finite subset of RF, then its pre image is also finite. So, you, so, so you'll be mapping from RFF into RFE. Okay. That's when you assume properness. And this assignment is the same. So, so that's what you change. So now you assume properness and, and uh, you replace OG by POG. So now you take only this graph homomorphism graph proper. That's exactly what you need. For this to be well defined in a very restricted scenario, and and uh, uh, then this defines a contravariant functor from to, to the category of um, semi rings, not unical semi rings, but arbitrary semi rings. Okay. And again, uh, if you if you do this exercise, then this statement is clear. Uh, why? Because. Uh, but the, the, the contravariant functoriality is obvious anyway. And uh, what you really need to verify is that uh, F inverse A times F inverse B is the same as F inverse of A times B. But if this works for all maps, it also works for proper maps. If it works for all subsets, it also works for finite subsets. So you are done, okay? That's why I'm not writing this part as an exercise. Okay. So it seems, wow, and actually I'm perfectly on time. I'm amazed. So this is uh, what I should have taught you in the previous semester. And Alex, I hope he is present. Let me double check. Alex, are you there? Yes, you are there. So, so, so Alex in the yes, recitation. Yeah, hello. Uh, hey. Alex in the recitation class will explain to you these examples. Yes, I'm skipping these examples because Alex will explain them in the recitation class and I will throw in a bunch of other examples. So I think we'll spend like one hour today at the recitation class discussing examples of, of uh, graph morphisms. Okay, so now I stop sharing. And I start sharing or oh, there's something in chat. Oh, still on train almost there. Okay, good. Good, you are there because you just said hello. Okay, good. <laughs> I close. And now I share screen, but now I share my whiteboard. Share. I tidy the mess. Oh, it's not so easy. I enlarge it. I put these parts up. And I have to take my magic pen. <laughs> <clears throat> and my 
my notes. So roughly speaking, we are going to do uh, these facts five and six, but now in the realm of path algebra. Okay. But maybe ah, I promise you that when I go to the whiteboard, I will uh, explain to you some things. So uh, if X and Y are locally compact Hausdorff, then a proper map, I have a continuous map F from X to Y. I, I, I call it proper whenever you have the preimage where the preimage of a compact set is compact. So when you are in discrete topology, when the only compact set is a finite set, and uh, you are just saying that the perimeter of a finite set is finite, which means you are finite to one. Okay. But uh, uh, the concept of properness is defined for arbitrary topological spaces. And if you are extremely curious, you can go to Bourbaki, uh, to this volume dedicated to topology. And you have some mind boggling definition of properness. This is something universally closed. And, and it's, it's defined, well, it's, it's difficult to grasp what it is. However, you can prove that uh, if your topology is locally compact Hausdorff, then this crazy definition of properness, universal closeness property, in fact, boils down to this very simple and comprehensible condition. See, proper maps are maps that don't kill infinities. You cannot shrink infinity to something fine. That's not proper. Okay. And why is it so important? Uh, when you study the Baumkorn conjecture, one of the most famous conjectures in mathematics, by the way, it's still open. So if you want the Fields Medal or the Abel Prize, just solve it. And, and you're done. Uh, you see, it's very interesting and very difficult to study a theory of sister algebras, say reduced convolution sister algebras of locally compact house of topological groups. It's very interesting and very difficult. All, already for discrete groups, if G is discrete, it's, it's still difficult. Okay. So, uh, Alan Kohn and Paul Baum had an idea of how to compute it in terms of something more geometric. And in order to do it, what they did, they, they, they uh, took, this is so-called E bar G, it's the universal proper space. For every locally compact topological group, you can define the universal proper space. Like in the category theory, if, if you have any proper action of G on any space, and ah, I didn't tell you what the proper the proper action is, but this is uh, uh, this is very natural and very very useful. This is what you use, for instance, to define principal bundles. So let me say it: uh, when I have a G space, which means I have a continuous map from X cross G into X, satisfying the obvious conditions that X G H is X G H with parentheses shifted. And another non-trivial condition that the neutral element acts by identity. And of course, everything is continuous, okay? Then you say that this action is proper if the induced map, you go from X G to X cross X, mapping X comma G to X comma X G, if this map is proper. So say that an action is proper if this induced map is proper. And that's very beautiful because when you want to define a principal bundle like Henri Cartan, then you must get that the action is free. Let's not, let's not go into it right now and proper. 
So, so famous conditions of uh, Aurica town about uh, continuity of a translation map and so on and so forth and closure of the image, they are tantamount to the properness, at least for locally compact outdoor spaces. I don't even want to think what happens beyond this category. I mean, with properness at least, okay? So, so and, 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 and also th th this is precisely a starting point of hope Galois theory. So, uh, for instance, Sophie is doing uh, quantum principle bundles, and that's the starting point. All right. So I, I hope I. Oh, sorry, I didn't finish uh, this arrow here. So here, what you take is K homology of this space, equivariant K homology, if I remember correct. And this is supposed to be an isomorphism. This is a conjecture. And, and and the idea is that this is something given more geometrically, more computable. So this is an isomorphism. You understand the K theory of a convolution sister algebra. And this is one of the most famous conjectures in the whole mathematics. I think it's already well over 20 years old. And we don't know if it's true even for G equal to SL3Z. We don't know if it's true. This is a very simple dispute group, but it's not amenable. And this is why it's difficult. Okay, so these are just comments. A cherry on the cake, a dessert. It's not relevant to the lecture, but uh, I don't want to bore you to death. I want to motivate you somehow why certain concepts are interesting. And now let us go back really to the course and study these uh, elementary facts five and six, but in the context of path algebra. Uh, we already defined the category OG and POG and IPG and DPG, so you know what it is. Uh, now I'll give you two more definitions. So Ka, uh, the category of K algebras. Maybe let me be more precise. The category of algebras. over a field K. And when I take UKA, this is the category of unital algebras over K. And of course, in KA morphisms are just algebra homomorphisms. And in UK, morphisms are unit or other homomorphisms. So in this category, we preserve a unit. In this one, we have no unit, we don't care. Okay, so zero is a perfectly uh, well defined uh, homomorphism of algebras. Okay, so now when I have all the notation established, I can write the first proposition. The covariant proposition, as before, we'll have two cases, covariant and contravariant. Okay, so the first proposition claims that the assignment given in the following way, I take objects of IPG. So remember, this is the category of graphs with morphisms being path homomorphisms that are injective on vertices, okay? But for objects, it doesn't matter. E is just any graph. And surprise, surprise, I assign to it its path algebra. Okay, so this is my functor. And of course, a path algebra Ke is an algebra over a field K. So it's in my category, it's an object in the category Ka. Now it's getting more interesting when you take morphisms. So, so here I have, I have a, a well, I've just denoted by F, I see. Okay. 
But remember, this, this is not necessarily a length preserving morphism. And I map it to the following homomorphism of algebras. I mean, I just write it as F star. It's covariant, so it goes from Ke to Kf. And it's a morphism in Ka. So I claim that this is a homomorphism of algebras. And I still have to tell you how it is defined. And it is defined in the following way. For every path P in E, so if you want an element of FPE, you see, in, in order to define um, a, a map from KE to KF at the level of vector spaces, it suffices that I tell you what it does to a basis, to its canonical basis given by KPs with P running the whole set FPE. And this is precisely what I'm doing here. So, so I take, uh, I take, uh, I take uh, chi P in KE and I map it to something very obvious again, chi of FP. And of course it makes sense because F of a path is a path, but now in E, so chi FP is of course an element of KF. So now what you should prove and what we'll prove in just a second that that this is a really a homomorphism of path algebras. But the whole I didn't finish the sentence. So the assignment defines a covariant functor. Sorry, it's a bit messy, but I hope you can read it. It's neatly put in the lecture notes. But that's not the end of the claim. Just as before in the realm of semi-rings, uh, we also have a situation in which we want to take care of unitality. So now we, we restrict one category to BPG and another category to U, UKA. So we will look only at, at these um, path homomorphisms of graphs that are bijected on vertices, and then this will preserve uh, the unitality at the level of path algebra. Okay. So furthermore, the same assignment but with, well, I should put it this way. The same assignment restricted, let me put it this way. The same assignment restricted to the subcategory of BPG even by graphs with finitely many vertices. So see, I'm doing double restrictions. First, I restrict uh, uh, IPG to BPG which means I restrict morphisms, but I keep the object. But now I, I keep morphism and restrict objects. I didn't want to introduce yet another name for a category. Okay, this is why I, I just wrote it simply in English. So that's the restriction at the domain side. Okay. Uh, uh, and and, and this, this yields. Oh, wait a second, should I, should I say? No, 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 that's the same, of course, construction. So the assignment is the same. Use a covariant functor to UKA, so to the category of unital algebras over 
the ground truth k. All right. So you see, uh, everything in the second statement follows from the preceding statement except for unitality. And look, but it all holds water because uh, when I uh, restrict my objects in IPG to graphs with finite indices, then of course Ke is a unit of path algebra. Yeah, we know it, we proved it. So, so that will be an object in UKA. And uh, then this assumption of bijectivity will simply allow you to check that the unit is preserved. Yeah. And, but we are going to do it this time. It's not an exercise. Okay, that's the end of, of, of the claim. Now it's proof. So for starters, F star from KE to KF is a linear map, obviously. Right, because it's given by its values on, on the canonical basis. It maps the canonical basis into the canonical basis. So of course it defines a linear map, it's no brainer, okay? And now you have to check that this is a homomorphism of algebra, okay? to check that F star is a homomorphism of algebras. Now using the injectivity of F, Restricted to E zero, we compute okay. So now to prove that this is an algebra homomorphism, I have to use this injectivity assumption. Okay. So let's compute F star of chi P chi Q. As usual, it's just delta of, sorry, TE. TE of P, SE of Q, F, of chi PQ well and I rewrite this conicus delta nothing happening here and now I apply the definition of f so I'll get f I will get chi of S PQ. But for any morphism between graphs, F of PQ is always F of PFQ, right? So, so maybe because I'm too lazy to rewrite it, I'll write F of P F of Q, okay? In the notes, it's a separate step, but <laughs> I cannot just copy and paste. At least I don't know how to do it here. All right. And the crucial step, the crucial step is right here because I'm going to use the injectivity. So what happens is that I, I leave that part alone. So it's chi of FP FQ, but I'm going to fiddle with this conical delta. And, and I claim that I can simply write here delta of TFF of P as FF of Q. 
So I have cone across delta, but now it's TF of F of P chronic cross delta SF F of Q. Okay, and 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 why do the, so here I, I I say using injectivity on vertices, of course. Well, you see, you know that TF of FP is the same as F of TE of P. And you know that SF of F of Q is the same as F of SE of Q. All right? But, but you want to make sure that the same, that these delta have the same properties. So uh, obviously when, when uh, TE of P is equal to SU of Q, then also FTE of P is equal to FSE of Q and you have ones in both cases. But how about zero? You want to have it when TE of P is different from SE of Q, then also FTE of P is different from FSE of Q. But that's precisely injectivity on the set of vertices. So that was the crucial step. Well, the rest is, is very easy. But let me finish it nevertheless. Um, so, so now, of course, uh, with everything I wrote here, I can just write it as chi fp times chi fq, if chronicles delta absorbed into my definition of the product. But then it's, of course, nothing but f star of chi p times f star of chi q, and we are home and dry. Okay. Sorry, maybe it was too fast. Are you are you happy with this calculation? I explained the crucial step. The rest is just you know. <laughs> Bookkeeping. So hence F star is an algebra homomorphism as planned. And now the covariance is obvious. Because if you take F circle G star, that's the same as F star circle P star, okay? Or if you want to check it uh, directly, what is uh, F G star on chi P? That's chi f circ g of p. That's uh, chi of f of g of p. But uh, this is uh, nothing but um, f star of chi g p. And this is nothing but F star of G star of chi P. This is nothing but F, circ, F star circ G star of chi P. Right, I mean, it, it, it's obvious. So I didn't bother to write it down in the lecture notes. Okay, so I wrote it for the sake of completeness, but that's a thing you do in your memory. So it's not typed up. Okay, okay. So what remains to be to be verified? Well, just unitality. So so by, by now uh, we already proved the first part of a proposition. Okay, we really have a covariant functor. From, from the category, uh, what was it, this uh, IPG, okay, to the category KA. With the only non-trivial thing to be verified, uh, which was the, the homomorphism property yeah, of F star. 
but we just did it and and using uh, the injectivity assumption all right so now to have a second part of a claim as i already explained all that we need to do is to verify unitality under the additional assumptions now we assume that that um, uh, our path algebras are unital so the sets of vertices are finite and we are bijective on these sets so finally yeah, but i cannot write with any razor If E and F are graphs with finitely many vertices, The, 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 the bijectivity of F bijectivity of F restricted. Let me use the same symbol, a map from E0 to F0. So this is bijective, not the, the, the map on the whole set. Yeah. So the bijectivity of F restricted to, to F uh, from E0 to E0 um, will allow us to prove inequality. Yeah. Guarantees, let me put it this way, guarantees. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I cannot spell guarantees. It guarantees the unitality of F star. So by the assumption that uh, we take only graphs with finitely many vertices, we are now talking on the unital path algebras. So we land in the category of unital path algebras. And of course, we'll be proved that uh, this assignment that we are discussing uh, is uh, an algebra homomorphism. So now what we have to prove is that if our algebras are unital, which happens when e, the sets of vertices are finite, then the unit is preserved. And injectivity is not enough. You will see it in a second. Okay, let me compute it on the next page. Well, I take F star of the unit in Ke, but the unit in Ke is the sum over all vertices in E of chi v, where v is a vertex in E0. Then, of course, this is the same as the sum over all v in E0, chi f v, all right? And now by the bijectivity, I know that if I run the set, uh, if I run uh, v through the whole E0, I run f v through the whole f0 because it's a bijection. And injectivity is not enough and because because imagine I have one vertex more in in my f zero, which is not in the image on all map and that's it. It's not a unit it's a projection. Or an item potent because we have no star here. Okay. So that's it. This is a uh, hi. I'm sorry. So I can still write it down as sum over W in um, F zero of chi W. So I map a unit into unit. So this proves the first proposition, okay? So that's the covariant setting, yeah? Just as we had it with uh, uh, semi-rings, using path homomorphisms of graphs with appropriate restrictions on what happens with indices, uh, sorry, vertices, we can claim that we have nice 
uh, covariant function. And the next step, as you can guess, is the contravariant setting. But the good news is that it's much uh, more complicated. And it's also something that uh, we are going to use uh, later on for graph sister algebra because we are interested in uh, mapping push out diagrams into pullback diagrams. And you can ask so why not make mapping using a covariant construction and mapping uh, um, push out diagrams of graphs into push out diagrams of algebras? Well, that's because push out diagrams of algebras are not so interesting from my point of view. Pullbacks are very important. They give you my Vittorius six term exact sequence in K theory and so on and so forth. When you stop algebras, pullbacks are important. Of course, you can do also push outs. But there's an wrote the whole paper about push outs of sister algebra. But they are huge. There are some free pro amalgamated free products and so on and so forth. These are some crazy constructions. Yeah? Some, something very universal. But uh, when you talk pullbacks, that's bread and butter. This is what you encounter on every street corner. Many, many things that we encounter in real life in non symmetric topology probably has pullback decomposition. If you want to, for instance, study CW complex structures of, of projective spaces after quantization, well, welcome to pullbacks. So that, that's why the contravariant construction is more interesting for us. But also, it, it's less trivial. I mean, it's not very difficult, but. Uh, there are some stumbling stones that you have to climb over. Okay. Okay, we have 12 minutes, so I don't think I will prove it all the way, but at least I will state it. And I'm wondering maybe I should use the next page. So now this proposition reflects the elementary fact number six that we discussed at the beginning. And all the met the categories POG and KA and, and uh, UKA, so you are at home with the notation. Now we claim the following the assignment. I take objects in the category POG. So an object is just any graph. And of course, as before, I assign to it a uh, path algebra. But now remember what the path algebra is. I'm taking the space of all finite paths and I'm taking all finite supported maps. Okay. So let me write it down like this. Okay. And yeah, that's a construction of a path algebra. So here nothing changed. This is the same. You see, on objects, it's the same construction. I just assign to my graph its path algebra. So of course it's an object in sorry, 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 in uh, KA. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, what happens on morphisms. It's like a morphism in POG. So remember, these are graph homomorphisms. So these guys preserve lengths and they are proper maps, right? So graphs are arbitrary, but our graph homomorphisms are induced from really a proper graph homomorphism and and uh, so they preserve lengths and and the maps are proper so i, I take such a map let me denote it uh, i think i just denoted it as uh, yeah somehow i wanted to be more i, I wanted to, to to make it clear that, that now we really are talking about the induced map from fpe to fpf so I take my morphism of graphs 
it goes from E to F. Oops. And I assign to it, well, it's supposed to be contravariant. Uh, so I, uh, sorry, this is F1, yes, not F star, this is F1. I assign to it F star going from KF to KE, so no very versal of arrows. And now I want it to be a morphism in my category of algebras over K. And how do I define it? And here is all the first interesting thing because this definition is no longer obvious. I mean, nothing is difficult here, but, but at least something is not obvious. <laughs> that, that's already a nice thing. So I take an element in KF. Of course, it suffices, it must be linear map. So it suffices that I define it on the canonical basis elements. And I map it to the sum over all Q that are in the pre-image of P, chi Q. So I hope we agree that this is not entirely obvious. You see that it's a well-defined linear map, that's clear, because I map, uh, but I no longer map the canonical basis to the canonical basis. I, I map the canonical basis to an element, which I'm allowed to do. Before, for the covariant uh, construction, not only my morphies were more general, but also uh, I mapped the canonical basis to the canonical basis. Yeah, I have my induced morphies, so morphies that preserve lengths, and, and I map the canonical basis into something. But it is well defined because you see, by the assumption of properness, that's this capital P standing here, I know that my, my map F is proper. So therefore the, the pre-image of any path is finite. So the sum is finite. So I really give you an element in the path algebra of E. Okay, but let me end the sentence. To make it crystal clear, uh, I say that F from, sorry, sorry, sorry. from FPE to FPEF is the induced map okay uh, and uh, well, I have to make the claim. It's a, this defines a contravariant function. Defines a contravariant function. That's it. First part of the proposition. As before, it also has the second part to account for unital path algebras. And let me phrase it in the following way. So, furthermore, the same assignment. Restricted to to what? To the subcategory given by graph to finitely many vertices
we use a contravariant functor, but now to the category UKA. So here, this is very mild. I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, not doing anything with morphisms. Already for my first statement, I have to take proper morphisms. And, and, and this doesn't change when I want to prove the unitality. Now to, to, to prove the unitality, the, the unitality, nothing changes in my morphisms. I just uh, have to make sure that, that I'm in the realm of unit of algebras. So, so, so the only assumption I'm making that, that this assignment, uh, is, uh, which goes from E to KE, the assignment of, of, of the path algebra to a graph, that, that, that I land in uh, the category UKA, so that my, my path algebra is unitary. But that's if and only if the set of vertices is finite, as we know from previous lectures. Okay? And once I ensure this simple restriction, so nothing done with morphism, they are already quite restricted. Now I just restrict my attention to graphs with finite many indices, uh, vertices when everything works, that, that procedure, this assignment, these definitions, um, now uh, give me a functor, a contravariant functor into the category UKA. So in order to, to, to prove the second part of the proposition, given the first part, again, all that we have to do is to make sure that when our path algebra is unital, the unit is preserved, that's all. We already have our recipe, you see? This is our recipe. That's the fundamental idea. This is our recipe. This is how we are saying that, aha, uh -huh, given uh, a morphism of graphs with some properties, I give you a homomorphism of algebras. And now the same homomorphism of algebras, when these algebras are unital, preserves the unit, that's all, okay? But actually both calculations <laughs> require some thinking. And because uh, I'm only one, I have only one minute uh, left. I think I will not start giving the proof because there is no way I, I can finish it. I need at least half an hour to do this proof. Sorry, no, I need 15 minutes to do this proof, but somehow I don't want to get into the habit of always extending the lecture. Um, so let me skip it, especially that, you know, as I told you, as I promised you, there are two points at which um, you really have to show something. Uh, let me postpone it, postpone it to uh, the next, not week, the next, uh, we'll do it in two weeks because um, for, 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 for all those of you who don't know Poland, the 3rd of May is a national holiday. So next Monday is uh, 3rd of May and is a national holiday. So we are not allowed to teach. So we'll meet again in, in, in two weeks. But, but maybe at least I will give you uh, in the remaining two minutes, uh, because we started two minutes late, uh, I'll give you at least a sneak preview. And the sneak preview is that indeed, this assignment, which looks a little bit weird, okay? But this assignment, so, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that uh, F star, of chi p, that's by definition such a funny sum, such a funny finite sum. Okay. But how did I get it? I mean, I didn't have a wild dream about it, I just computed it. Because you see, the most natural way to do it, remembering that after all, ke is nothing but finitely supported functions from f. P E. Okay. All right. I'm just I just want to use uh, the following fact that that whenever I have I have uh, the set of maps say finitely supported from X to K where X is any set and finally supported from Y to K and I have a map from X to Y, which is proper. So finite to one, these are just sets of the topology is discrete. Then this F 
induces a pullback. And the pullback is, is very simple. It's, it's a F star of alpha is by definition alpha composed with F, okay? So if I have a map from, from uh, Y to K, and, but I want to have a map from X to K, well, I just compose it with F. And first I go from X to Y, then from one to K, okay? So, so, so basically what, what I'm, what I'm uh, proving is for starters, that's not the end of the story, is that, that this is really chi P composed with F. Yeah, when I think of chi P as a map, from FPF into the field, then F is a map from FP to FPF, so I can compose it, and lo and behold, you can compute that this is this form. And then at least at the level of vector spaces, I say, hey, I did have a contravariant functor, but it's still quite tricky, though not difficult, to check that this is an algebra homomorphism, but that we really do in two weeks. Okay, so let's resume at uh, 11.30 in 27 minutes. I stop recording. Thank you very much.